God, by your Spirit, we pray that you make these words your word, so that our lives might be your lives, that we might be transformed to be transformed in your word. To this end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We are in Mark's Gospel. We're in the first chapter, reading verses 14 through 20, often seen where Jesus calls the first of his disciples. Let us listen for what the Spirit may be speaking to the church. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me. And I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. I left off the first two verses of the scripture for those who were looking closely, which began with John being arrested. Once John was arrested, he went to prison, and as soon as it happened, Jesus went away to Galilee and picked up John's mantle of preaching, proclaiming that the good news of the kingdom had come. Most of the time when we talk about this passage of Scripture, we leave that part off. Even if we read it and remember to start at verse 14 instead of verse 16, we never talk about it. It's like a throwaway line, and then we end up talking solely about the fishing for people, or for those who grew up in the church many years ago as children, fishers of men is the way it was often proclaimed. So, I want to talk about fishing for a moment, and by moment I mean a really short moment, because the one time where I caught fish was at a uh, training ground over at Forest Park, where Cub Scouts were allowed to go, and I was teaching Dylan and Lacey how to cast, and I didn't put any bait, and I cast it out, slowly pulled it back, and lo and behold, I pulled the fish out of the water. <laughs> I was disappointed, because I really don't want to touch that thing. <laughs> no, you know, I really didn't, but I spent that day pulling fish off the line for the kids because, well, that's what you do <laughs> when you're a parent or caring for children. So as a child, though, I used to go to a lake house, and we were allowed to stand on the end of the pier and cast a, a, a line into the end, into the water, and for hours on end caught nothing but seaweed. I mean, I didn't know really that the fact that there were speedboats running back and forth was probably the reason why all the fish were hiding. But it kept me busy and out of my parents' hair. So they let me keep doing it. So as a child then, when I hear this passage about fishing for others, even though the line in there is about nets, what I often envisioned was people throwing a line into the water. And then when I would hear the passage, then I heard it as what we were supposed to do was to go out and drag people into church. This was about church membership and growth and, or saving souls. And that meant being on a church committee <laughs> and being in a pew. But the truth is, when we start talking about fishing here at this time and this place in this gospel, we have to go and recognize that it was more than just a pastime. In fact, fishing in Galilee at the time of Jesus had become more than just a subsistence way of being in the world. Rome was good about conglomeration. Rome was good about wringing out every dollar from every possible industry. And in that region, fishing was an economic enterprise. It was the empire's economic enterprise. Sometimes when we hear about John and their family, it's like, oh, they left the family business and they went and followed Jesus. How awful. Well, the truth is, we think probably more like these fishing nets didn't even belong to them. 
You wonder if on some level that they have had to take out a loan to get that net. That they had had, you know this, they had to get licenses, they had to pay taxes, they had to make sure that Rome got their cut. So much so that they probably didn't own anything that they did and they were working simply just to pay the next bill. I know that seems odd. Right? In some ways, what you ought to be thinking about when you hear these fisher folk, they were not captains of industry, despite what Creflo Dollar has preached. These were people who probably, on some level, were similar to sharecroppers. Working the land they did not own with tools that they had to pay back. They were struggling to get by. And when you think about it that way, when Jesus says, come along, drop those things and follow me, it changes the tenor of what's going on. In some ways, it reminds me as a child growing up in Indiana when the ravages of the farms, the family farms that were destroyed. Some of you might remember this, but I remember driving by the churches near the courthouses and seeing the crosses on the line, that, on the lawn that represented the number of families that had lost their farms after generations. Interestingly, though, farming didn't end. We now have industry farms. So what you have to think about, in some ways, I think, was the pressure that James and John and their families and all the other folks who were trying to wring a living out of that Sea of Galilee, which is not that big, does not have that many fish. At some point, you end up scraping just to get by. And yet, Rome continued to make hand over fist money on this enterprise by pitting those small groups of folks against one another, paying the lowest possible amount that they could. All of this sounds familiar. What Jesus is probably doing in some way is saying, walk away from the empire's economy, and I'll teach you a new way to be in the world. I think by the time that Jesus comes and talks to James and John and Peter and Andrew, they have already heard the message. As a child, I always heard this and thought, Jesus must have had some sort of magic, because here they were busy working, and all of a sudden, like, oh, I'm going to go follow Jesus. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's honest if we play it that way. I've heard preachers in the past say, if Jesus came and asked you to follow today, would you give all this stuff up? Well, I want to get to know Jesus if he shows up again a little bit. Because that's the thing. Jesus was a known quantity in that area. He had already been preaching. In the passage I did not read in the verse, Jesus has already been preaching. People have heard that he's proclaiming a new kingdom. A new empire. A new way of being in the world that is different than participating in the ways of the Roman Empire. Was it possible? Because here's the thing that I'm convinced of. It wasn't just James and John and Andrew and Peter who were fed up. I bet Zebedee was fed up. I bet the other workers were fed up. I bet the whole area was fed up with the way it was working and knew that it wasn't working and they didn't know how to change it. And that's why James and John and Andrew and Peter are named because they were fed up enough to do something about it. I don't know what the road ahead looks like in following Jesus, but keep doing this stuff day after day is enough to kill me and I'm not going to do it anymore. I think when he says to them, you'll fish for people, that image of the giant net thrown out and brought in for everyone. They saw a glimpse of the possibility that this was bigger than just what was going on in their neighborhood. What we know about the Greek, and I know that this is not all that interesting, but it's worth noting. When it says that James and John were fishermen, that's not um, an, an exact interpretation. The, inter the uh, translation ought to be, they are fishermen of fish. That's literally what the Greek says. And why that's important is over here, then Jesus says, I will make you a fisherman of people. Now, now, here's the thing that I want to mention briefly, and I'm going to talk about it again later in more detail, is that what they're talking about is fish represented economic reality. Fish were property, not of the fisher, the men who were there, but of Rome. And so what Jesus is offering them, 
here in this calling. I know you probably have never heard it preached this way. I don't know that I've preached it this way. I usually avoid this passage for a couple of reasons. But, I'll tell you why later. But what he's offering them is to lift up people over the economy. And that will happen throughout his ministry, right? Think about the feeding story. The first time the disciples go, well, we know how this works. You've got to go to the, you gotta go to the neighborhood. You've got to pull out your money. And you've got to go to the store. And you've got to feed them. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let's not do that. Let's, let's not participate in the empire's economy today. Let's share our food. But what started there was a glimpse here. This is not a story that's outside of the realm of Jesus' ministry. It's like, oh yeah, y'all come on, okay, we're gonna follow. What he's, what he's laying out right here is an alternative. Come and be part of an alternative of God's grace that goes beyond all boundaries. It's a glimpse in this moment of God's grace. The invitation is an invitation to leave the ways of empire, the values of empire, that does not value people. I think back most recently, but it's always been this way. Folks get really, really uptight when we see the destruction of private property. Windows get broken and people lose their minds. I'm with you until you're violent. But what's really odd about this is that nobody's getting wound up about the fact that we have the in kinds of inequality in our communities, we have policing that discriminates. We have schools that are unequal. We have people living in houses without running water within walking distance of this church. We have babies dying at birth at rates that rival what's considered and called offensively third world nations. But nobody considers that to be violent. Isn't that interesting? Because we've decided that property and fish matter more than people. So we're going to cling to our nets. What Jesus is saying is you ought to be as undone, in fact more undone, at these things than a few broken windows. Because last time I checked, you could fix those. And no one would know that it was broken. It is a lot harder to fix people who have been broken by generations of trauma as adults. And yet, we keep valuing fish over people. The title of the sermon, and I told you I would get there eventually, Arresting John. I'm not really going to say much about John the Baptist other than the fact that the call to discipleship isn't just about this new way of living in the world, which should be inspiring, but it also ought to be scary because it begins with John going to jail. Did John break windows? No. Did John murder anybody? No. Did John steal from anyone? No. Unless you consider the people that left the synagogue and went out uh, to see him, but they went back. John did none of those things. He was in jail for preaching the coming kingdom of God. Because Rome understood that when you start talking about the kingdom, the empire of God, that it's an alternative to what exists. And we can't have alternatives to what exists because that might give people hope. So if you put John in prison, if you cut off the head, the movement will die. Well, guess what? It didn't. You can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. <coughs> so over our call to discipleship, our call to follow Jesus, is this sense that it can be dangerous. It can cost us something. It might not to the degree that it costs others. It might not cost us our lives, but it sure is going to, at least on some level, cost us something. And if it doesn't, it's not discipleship. I'll say that again. If it doesn't cost us something, we're not following Jesus. Now, I don't know what that is in each one of our lives and what it means for us as a faith community, but, but it needs to cost us something. Otherwise, we're just observers. <clears throat> Someone said, why didn't Jesus call more people? A lot of people were following Jesus. 
He called the ones who were willing to put something in the game. When they put the nets down, all of a sudden they were resisting the ways of the empire. That's what they do. It's not just, oh, yeah, sounds like nice guy. Let's go this way. They have made a calculated decision to give up the nets of the empire and pick up the nets for God. It disrupts if enough people put their nets down. What's Rome going to do? So Jesus picks up John's mantle of proclaiming this coming kingdom. Built in love. A transforming love. That will move us from understanding ourselves as simply functionaries in the economy. When we stop seeing other people as objects and see them as people. And recognize that decisions that are made in boardrooms and in our homes and in our kitchen tables. Are more than just about dollars and cents. And it is, I believe, not until we finally recognize, and we do recognize, I hear from you and I hear from others, that people are fed up with the way things are today. Every one of those fisher folk around, around that village were fed up too. All of them were fed up. But some of them were so fed up that they said, yeah, even the arrest of John won't stop me. That I'm willing to put feet to my words. And I believe that when we do that, and it's going to look different, I've said this before, for each one of us, but each one of us are called to drop whatever net we're clinging to and figure out how to pick up the net for God. I wish I could give you an easy answer to say this is what it looks like for you. Now, I will say, happy to sit down and talk and we can figure out where the Spirit may be at work in your life. That's Part of what pastoral counseling is about. You may know, and it just may be helpful to talk to someone else, if not me, someone. What could it look like? But I am convinced when enough people get fed up enough to put down those nets of the empire, to not be afraid to hear that John was arrested before we say yes, when people finally do that, that's when we know a real change will come. That's what it means to fish for the kingdom of God. And that doesn't sound as boring to me as throwing a line.